Welcome back to the Home Lab, and I've got another really interesting experiment to show you today. You might have seen the video that I did on magnetic core memory. Well, today what we're going to do is look at this little bit of core memory that I've actually built, and we're going to wire it up and simulate how a magnetic core memory stores data. But before we start, I just want to say again a huge thank you to you for supporting my channel and watching my videos. Um, I uploaded a very esoteric one the other day on the electron mirror using um, uh, electron guns in Teltron tubes. And for some reason that I really can't understand, it's just got thousands and thousands of views very, very quickly. So um, I'm really grateful to you for that. Also, I'd like to say thank you to my sponsors, PCBWay, who have really encouraged me to go and make videos. They uh, constantly get in touch and say, come on, make some more videos and we'll encourage you to make more. Do go and have a look at their website to see the services they do, because as a maker, they do some really useful things, particularly bespoke um, printed circuit board making for your projects, but also CNC machining and 3D printing and things like that. They've got a really good website that's got lots of projects on it from other makers, and that might give you some ideas for something that you might like to try. So just before we have a closer look at this little bit of core memory that I've made with uh, nine bits of uh, data storage on it, perhaps a really quick recap on how this kind of memory works. So um, it consists normally of thousands and thousands of ferrite toroidal cores. And if you remember, you can magnetize these uh, in one of two directions. Um, of course, they can be completely uh, randomly magnetized, but when you put data into them, you can magnetize them so the magnetic field goes round in one direction, perhaps anti-clockwise, and maybe stores a zero. Or you can reverse that magnetism and have it going clockwise and maybe storing a one. The next bit is getting that data out of the core and the process of reading the data destroys the data, so it has to be rewritten. So what we're going to look at today is firstly, how do we get data into one of the cores so we don't put it into all of them at the same time? And then how do we write and later read the data and then rewrite it? So um, very quickly, you remember there's an array of little toroidal cores and there's a minimum current required to magnetize the core. That's really important. Anything below that value and it won't magnetize each little toroidal core. So you pass wires through the cores, but the clever thing is you only pass half the current needed in this direction to magnetize the core and the other half of the current that will be needed to take it up to the full value that will cause the core to magnetize is past 90 degrees in this direction. And where those two currents meet, you will get twice the strength of magnetic field and therefore you'll be able to magnetize the core at the intersection of those two wires. All other cores will have a current passing through them, but they won't have two currents coincident at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the core in the middle. That seems to be the inter interesting one to do, the easiest one to do. So if we pass current this way and that way, uh, all the cores in this direction will feel half the current. All the cores in this direction will feel the other half current, but only the one in the middle will feel the whole current. So only this one's magnetism will be affected. So that was a very brief look at how magnetic core memory works. Obviously, you might want to look at my other video to see in detail um, how it actually stores data. But I hope you've got a good enough understanding now of the coincident currents and the magnetism, two different directions of magnetism in the little toroidal ferrite cores for me to now go onto the bench and show you how this would actually store and retrieve data. So let's just have a quick look at the layout of the little board that I've made. So I've got nine little toroids here, um, the ferrite cores in a little grid, and I've passed various wires through them. So to start off with, we've got the blue wires that go through like that in each row. And it's confusing, isn't it? Because you go up here, but these are X wires because they address cores in the X direction. 
Then I've got the red wires coming up this way, and even though they go across that way, they address cores that are in the vertical direction. So these are the Y wires. And of course, um, every core will have a blue, that's an X, and a red, uh, that's a Y wire, passing through it. So we can pass two currents uh, that will cross over in any particular core, and we can pass the currents up and from the left and magnetize it in one direction, or down and from the right and magnetize the core in the opposite direction. Now, I've added two other wires. There's a green wire that zigzags around the cores and passes through each core once, and it tries to keep an angle away from the red and the blue wires so it doesn't pick up their magnetic field. And this is the sense wire that's going to be used to pick up when the magnetism in a core changes. Finally, we'll deal with it near the end of the video, there's a very thin black wire, I couldn't fit one in that uh, was any thicker, and this is the inhibit wire. And I'll explain what that does, it's really only used when you have a whole stack of these cores, I've only got one plane here, but if you can imagine many others beneath it, um, maybe another eight, so I could store um, well, eight, maybe another seven, so I could store uh, one bit in this uh, core and then in the next and in the next and the next so I could store an 8-bit word. And the inhibit line zigzags up and down through each core once and we're going to use that to make sure that a core that has two currents passing through it actually has one of the currents cancelled so the overall effect is not to alter its magnetism. Anyway, you've got the general layout now so let's get it wired up and I'll show you how we store, retrieve and rewrite data. So to begin with, let's look at how we would store a zero in this central core. So I've set it up so to store a zero, we need to have a current passing down and to the left. And these two meters measure those two currents. And um, if they measure a positive current on both, we know we're passing current in the correct directions to store a zero. So um, what we'll do is we'll switch on and we don't need to sense that because we know that we're uh, storing a zero. It doesn't matter what state this core is in, whether it was in a zero already, whether it was uh, a one or whether it was completely randomly magnetized, we want to store a zero. So we're gonna force the magnetic field to be in the direction that we consider to be zero. So here we go, watch X and Y. We turn them on, that creates a current in the correct directions to magnetize that in the direction that we consider to be a zero. So we've stored a zero. So all we have to do now is go back and read that data. Right, so let's read the data in this little central core now. And if you remember, the way to read the data is to force that core to go back to a zero state. Well, it's already in a zero state, so when we force it to go back to a zero state, there won't be any change in magnetic field in it. And as there's no change in magnetic field, uh, we won't induce a current in the sense wire. So the sense meter won't read, so it will uh, see that the core is storing a zero. So we're going to force this core back to the zero state. Remember, it's already in the zero state. So here we go. There's the pulse. Nothing on the sense wire at all. So that core hasn't changed. So we know that it was in a zero state before. So we've read the fact that it was storing a zero. So now let's store a one in this central core. Now to do that, we've got to reverse its magnetism. We're not going to sense that and we're not going to use the inhibit meter. So it's these two you need to watch. But obviously to create a magnetic field that's in the opposite direction, we need to pass coincident currents through that central core in the opposite direction to when we write a zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass currents up through that core and towards the right. So watch the two meters. Um, the currents are obviously in the opposite direction. So when we magnetize that core, there you go. There are currents in the opposite direction and that will have stored a one in that little central core. So um, reading the data in a core is really interesting because it's actually a destructive process. If you remember, we've stored a one in that core, but in fact, to read it, what we do is we force it back to the zero state. If it was already at zero, 
then there's no change, so those currents have no effect. However, if it was in the one state, in other words, reverse magnetized, when we magnetize it back to the zero state, there'll be a change in magnetic field in that core. The change in magnetic field will induce a voltage on the sense wire, and because the sense wire is in a circuit, you will see a pulse. So the act of changing this, reading it, but changing it back to a zero, if we get a pulse, we know that its magnetism has flipped, so we know that it was originally storing a data bit as a one. So let's remagnetize that core as a zero, and if we see something on the sense meter, we know there's been a change in magnetic field, so there was definitely a one stored in it. So here we go. Let's pass the currents through. You need to watch X, Y and sense and see if you see a pulse. And there we go. OK. So if you remember, we've read the one bit of data in there, but we've read it by turning it back to a zero. So we've now got to rewrite that data so it remains in memory because reading data is a destructive process. So we've got to reverse the currents through this core and remagnetize it as a one. So watch these two meters, current in the opposite direction. There we go. I've disconnected the sense uh, because we don't need to sense that. But now we've remagnetized this central core back to a one. So that data is now back in memory to be read again at a later stage. So finally, and I hope you're still following me with this uh, nest of uh, wires and things, we're going to look at the role of the inhibit wire. So if you remember, it doesn't apply in this case because I've only got one core plane. But if this was the top one in a stack of eight, then I could store an eight bit word at once in every central core if I address them all at the same time. In other words, imagine I wanted to store zeros, so zero, 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 eight zeros. I would just connect um, together all the Y's downwards and all the X's uh, crossways. And uh, in every plane, the currents would be in the same direction. They cross at the same time in all of the central cores and they'd all store zeros. However, what if I wanted to store one zero, 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 zero? In other words, I wanted the top plane to store a number where the first, the most significant bit was a one. Well, I want to do it all at the same time. So I don't want to do each uh, core plane at a different time. I want to do them all in one go. So what I basically want to do is I want to store zeros in all of them apart from the top one. So what I do is I pass a current in the opposite direction through the inhibit wire, through all the cores in the top plane. So anything I do on the top plane, if there's a one already stored in there, anything I do in the top plane will not affect that one because I've got half the current coming down the inhibit line in the opposite direction to the two currents that want to turn it into a zero. I hope I've explained that reasonably well. So all the other planes uh, in the uh, core stack uh, will be reset to zero, but this one core in the top plane of the stack won't be reset to zero. It will retain its one because there's this extra third current going in the opposite direction, cancelling one of the coincident currents. So let's turn it on, send a pulse through this system that wants to reset this core to zero, but we're going to have an inhibit current in the opposite direction that will stop it from doing that. Right, so here we go. So you need uh, sort of good eyes here. You need to watch X and Y, the coincident currents trying to set this to zero and the inhibit current in the opposite direction cancelling out one of those currents, meaning the magnetic field in the, in the little core is not strong enough to flip it back to zero. So three, two, one, go. So there you saw the two coincident currents, but the inverted current, the current in the opposite direction, inhibiting the right to turn that from a one to a zero. So it retains its one of data and all the other cores in the stack, the seven below, will have not had an inhibit current. So they would have all been reset to zero or kept at zero if they were at a zero state already. 
So I do hope you enjoyed that video on magnetic core memory and how it works and my uh, little simulator that I built. It took a while, but um, it was great fun building it. Uh, one of the things about my videos that I always forget to say is after I finish talking now, uh, don't run away. Um, most of my videos, if you stay on after I finish speaking, I usually put some extra pictures in. And what I'll do today is I'll put some pictures in of me making this. So um, where I started with a sheet of Perspex and um, going on from there. Anyway, I'm sure I'll be making another video very soon. And please do join me then.